page 56. I wish there were more interesting things to tell you about the rest of the day, but the truth is that I spent most of it I spent dozing in and out of sleep while my family sat around watching me doze in and out of sleep. Well, at least Ma and Dad did. Spoonie was in and out of the room, making and taking phone calls, and whenever he was in the room, he was texting. I didn't know who all those texts were going to, but I knew at least some of them were going to his girlfriend, Barry. And funny enough, Barry's little brother was my homeboy, English. English Jones. The athlete, pretty boy, non-asshole who everybody loved. Yep, that guy. So I knew that if Barry knew what happened to me, English knew. And if English knew, Carlos and Shannon knew. And if those two dudes knew, then by Monday, half the school would know. And then I was asleep, and then I was awake again, and Clarissa brought lunch in. I had barely touched breakfast, the oatmeal, maybe a spoonful or two. It wasn't so bad, but after my father acted like my father, I had pretty much lost my appetite. I offered it to my mother, but she couldn't eat either. Spoonie ate the fruit cocktail and said it reminded him of elementary school. I used to love the grapes, but there were never enough of them, he said, holding the cup up to his face and slurping the fruit out. For lunch, Central Hospital served up its finest turkey club sandwich with vegetable soup. I ate half the sandwich after my mother pretty much forced me to eat something, and I have to say it was pretty good. All these years I had been hearing about how nasty hospital food was, and now that I finally got a chance to taste it, it wasn't half bad. Better than school lunch, that's damn sure. Still, nothing on the TV except for an overly dramatic Lifetime movie that my mother was totally into. A cliche stalker story. A woman meets a man on a bus on her way home from work. They exchange numbers, go out on a first date. He's perfect, attractive, smart, and has a good job as an audio engineer for her television shows. She's excited until she finds out he's wired her whole house so he can hear everything she does when he's not around. He can hear her shower and cook and talk to her friends about how crazy he is. And he listens to the feed while she while he watches TV on mute in the attic of the house next door where he lives. She doesn't know this, though. Total stalker. Shittiest actors on earth meets the shittiest story on earth, which makes for perfect Saturday afternoon movie for my mom. And then I was asleep and then I was awake again. But this time my folks were knocked out. Dad in the chair, his head bent at a painful looking angle, his mouth open wide. As usual, my mother, small, had tucked her knees to her chest and nestled into her chair. The only cushioned one, like a child. She looked so peaceful, so calm. It was nice to see her get some rest. The only person who wasn't asleep was Spoonie. He was still there, still fooling with his phone, still texting. Spoonie, I called out softly. I didn't want to wake my parents. It was nice to have the room quiet for a moment. It was nice to not see their eyes. My father's disappointed. My mother's all sad and worried. Spoonie looked up and rushed to my bed. What's up, man? You okay? I'm fine. I'm fine, I said, calming him down. Okay, he said, glancing down at his phone. Look, I talked to Barry and I told her what happened. She's been all over the internet checking to see if anything has been posted. You know, some live footage or something. And? And so far, nothing. But something's got to pop up. And I don't care what Dad says. This ain't right. He bit down on his bottom lip. It just ain't right. And you know me. You know I'm not going to sit here and let them sweep this under the rug like this is okay. I know. I got to admit, there was a part of me that, even though I felt abused, I wanted him wanted to tell him to let it go. To just let me heal, let me leave the hospital, let me go to court, let me do whatever stupid community service they wanted me to do, and let me go back to normal. I mean, I had seen this happen so many times. Not personally, but on TV, in the news. People getting beaten and sometimes killed by the cops, and then there's all this fuss about it, only to build up to a big heartbreak when nothing happens. The cops get off, and everybody cries and waits for the next dead kid to do it all over again. That's the way the story goes. A different kind of Lifetime movie. I didn't want all that. Didn't need it. But I knew not to even bother saying it. Not to Spoonie. No point. Because he'd agree that this was normal and that that was the problem. Spoonie had been dealing with this kind of crap for years. He'd never been beaten up, but he'd been stopped on the street several times, questioned by cops, asked to turn his pockets out, and lift his shirt up for no reason. He'd been followed around stores and stared on it bu- and stared at on buses by women who clutched their purses tight enough to poke holes in the leather. He was always a suspect, and I knew without him saying a word that the one thing he never wanted, but was sure would eventually happen, was for his little brother, the ROTC art kid, to become one too. So there was nothing that was going to stop him from fighting this. There was nothing I could do to calm him down. This was not going away. This was not getting swept under the rug of, oh well, not as Spoonie had anything to do with it. Quinn. In our town, it really isn't shocking to see a fight go down. 
I've seen kids with house keys tucked between their knuckles, throwing punches at each other. I've seen 10 guys from our school chasing four dudes from another school down a block and a stranger step into the melee with a bat to protect the guys who were outnumbered. And Gus O'Dwyer and I spent most of Jill's party telling ourselves we were tough as balls and that what happened outside Jerry's was nothing. It wasn't on our minds, we kept telling each other. No big deal. NBD. Dwyer wrote in beer on the wooden slats of the back porch with a nozzle from the keg. In fact, we spent most of the party on that back porch, ignoring everyone else. Gozo never said a word to Jill for me, and through the window I saw English moving through the room like the freaking king he is, getting up close to girls and making them laugh and giggle. I was sure if he found Jill it'd be the same. I was out there in the darkness of the back porch, looking in through the window to the bright kitchen like I was watching the whole damn party unfold on TV. I gave Gozo my flask at some point, and when eventually got it back, it was empty, but I didn't bug him about it. Because even though what happened at Jerry's was NBD, it was really all we talked about that night. My brother has to deal with that shit every day, Guzzo kept saying, and he just does it. No complaints. He's amazing. But what had always amazed me most about Guzzo's brother Paul was how he'd made time for me. I was 10 when my father died, and it was Paul who'd taken me down to Gooch to practice. Gooch was the neighborhood park, but Paul'd get us down there so early we'd have the whole court to ourselves. He showed me how to do the spider drill how to dribble with two balls, how to tuck my elbows when I shot. But the man I'd watched, gr- I'd watched grind a kid into the sidewalk, I don't know, was like someone else. Someone I couldn't place, some hulking animal stalking the shadows of my mind all night. I could hear his voice, and yet it wasn't him. I could see his face, and yet it wasn't him. Dwyer and Guzzo drank much more than I did, and they stood around the keg shouting out the lyrics of all the hip-hop songs blasting from the living room inside. Earlier that day, I'd imagined myself dancing with Jill, hands in the air, and then down along her back to her hips as she draped hers around my neck. But I spent most of the night still stuck on that sidewalk outside Jerry's, my heart pumping fiercely in my throat. And when someone at Jill's yelled that the cops had arrived, I almost thought I'd called them there with my mind. I slept terribly, but no matter how much or how little I sleep, I begin almost every day the same way. Ma's voice in my head, telling me what I needed to do, when I needed to think about, how I needed to act. But on mornings like this, or if Coach Carney was making us do suicides up and down the court for 15 minutes, or when Dwyer dropped another five-pounder on either side of the bar on my last rep in the weight room, it was Dad's voice in my head, or at least what I thought was his voice. I hadn't heard it in so long, I couldn't tell if it was his or if I was making it up. Whatever it was, it got me to where I needed to get. Push! If you don't know, if you don't, someone else will. Lift. If you don't, someone else will. Faster, 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 faster. I was in the living room, my feet tucked under the lip of the couch, firing through a set of 50 crunches when I heard Ma's actual sleepy voice dripped up and over the room. Don't kill yourself, she said. I'd been so into my push-ups and sit-ups and all that, I hadn't even heard her come home. Where's the mat, she continued. I kept at it in my head. Push, 25, 2, 3. Push, 26, 2, 3. Push. Ma sighed. Boys, she said. I heard her slough into the kitchen and open the fridge. I finished my set, sprang to my feet, and felt the room spin. Black dots popped across my vision, and before I passed out, I dropped to the couch and sat there catching my breath. Water? Ma asked from the kitchen. Yes, I whispered, shouted, but she was already on her way to give it to me. Ma sat down next to me and put her head on my shoulder. She was so much smaller than me now, and I liked the way she sometimes leaned into me or hugged me like she was excited. Not in a weird way, but with something I think might have been pride. She'd already kicked off her shoes, and she'd already changed into one of the three t-shirts she always wore around the house. I drank my water in two long gulps. Honey, you stink, Ma said, pulling away from me. Sorry. Gotta do my workouts, though, every morning. She rolled to the other side of the couch. Get off! You're gonna make the cushion stink. Ma, I'm serious. She pushed my shoulder and laughed, and I rolled onto the rug. Come on, she continued. You'll ruin the rug. She leaned back on the arm of the couch and crossed one leg over the other. She could have fallen asleep right there. The bags under her eyes were prunes. Loose strands of hair sprang from her head like she'd pulled a wool hat off, and the static electricity still hung in the air around her. But despite her exhaustion, somehow she always found a smile for me. What's the matter with you, she said, yawning. You look strange. Nothing, I said. She rubbed her face and squinted at me, and I knew her mind was working to put it all together. But she was so tired. I can trust you, right? She asked, still slouched into the corner of the couch. You'd tell me if something was the matter? 
Of course, I said quickly, even though there was a hell of a lot on my mind, but I didn't feel like telling her any about it, about any of it. I'm just going to rinse off, I said. It was going to be a two shower day. Then I got to hit the court. Coach is picking the starters this week. You'll make it, she said, as if fighting for a starting spot was NBD. As if it just come to me because I wanted it, not because I had to fight for it. I left Ma slumped against the armrest and went straight to the bathroom. I got the water running hot first, then switched it to cold just to fire up the senses and wake up. I still felt a little groggy from last night, and I was pissed at myself because after my workout, I wanted to get right to the court. I thought I had a real shot at being a starter, but next week was too important to coast through. I had to hit three more point. I had to hit more three pointers when we went around the world. I had to have the higher free throw percentage. English was so good he didn't have to give up the ball. So if he did, I had to make sure he felt more comfortable giving me the ball, which and that meant working harder to get open and more importantly making the shot when I got the ball because the scouts were coming. Of course, the stands were going to be filled, but a few of those seats at every game were the seats we were all playing for. Full ride to Michigan State full ride to UNC. My dad had college paid for because he'd gone through ROTC at City College, but I had to do even better. Butler, Notre Dame, Villanova, Wisconsin, Arizona, Duke. St. Springfield's son needed to go full ride too. Scouts paved the way and I had to show them who I was. I had to be a starter. And I was, I, as I was trying to psych myself up for a day of drills down at Gooch, I stepped out of the bathroom, wrapped only in a towel, holding my stank-ass clothes in a wad, and nearly ran right into Ma. She held my jeans in one hand and my flask in the other. She jutted her chin at me.